so let's keep talking about kinetics. And we started off talking about kinetics in this class by focusing on rate equations. And I expect you to be able to set up a simple rate equation for an elementary reaction. That's really easy. Elementary reactions have just a single transition state. But the goal for kinetics, a major goal for kinetics is to use it as a tool that allows you to ask, is this mechanism plausible? Um, and so what you really want to do is establish the concentration dependence of your reaction rates. So we talked about scenarios, not this exact scenario. Scenarios where you have some sort of equilibrating intermediates and then some reactive intermediate reacts in a slow rate determining step. And so I'll just write rate determining step. And so whenever you propose a kinetic mechanism, you should be identifying a rate determining step. I think this is the rate determining step. Most organic reactions follow this very simplistic scenario here. You have some reactive intermediate that's present in small amounts and then it reacts in a slow irreversible step. That's most organic reactions will fit into this scenario. Now you might argue correctly that well this isn't really one step. You, you can't just have a 1,3 hydride shift over to the oxygen. There's actually two steps two elementary reaction steps in between the ketone and the enol and I didn't draw them but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many steps are present in this pre-equilibrium as long as it's in rapid equilibrium under the conditions of the reaction. Could be five steps like a minium ion formation, doesn't matter. All you care about is some fraction of your molecules that you put in there exist in this state. And the more of them that are in this state, the faster your reaction will be. If there's ten times more enol, it will be ten times faster. So you often, you, you don't typically get to choose this equal, these equilibrium ratios. The important point is your rate equation will look something like this. Rate is equal to some rate constant for the slow stuff. How fast does this enol attach an elect, uh, attack an electrophile? Um, and then it will be related to the equilibrium constant. If I have more of this, I'll form product faster. And then it will depend on the concentrations. If I have ten, throw ten times more ketone in, I'll have ten times more product forming uh, per unit time. If I have ten times more electrophile, my reactions will be ten times faster. Everything about that equation will make sense. And if it doesn't all make sense, then you've done something wrong deriving that equation. Okay, so this is most organic reactions follow the scenario. And typically what you're interested in is this concentration dependence. Mainly you're interested in, is it first order in ketone to the first power? Or is it zeroth order, meaning no dependence, more ketone doesn't make the reaction faster? Or, or the same for the electrophile. Those are the things you're interested in. We typically talk about first order dependence or second order dependence or zeroth order dependence on concentration because that's how we determine mathematically um, whether, whether our kinetic mechanism uh, offers a true picture for what's going on in solution. Okay, so that's the typical scenario. And uh, again, there's these constants in here. But usually it's the concentration dependence. That's the easy thing for you to change just by scooping more reagents in or squirting in more reagent. That's the easy stuff you can change when you do chemistry. Okay, so um, but where do you, if you want to get stuff like this, rate constants, if you want to get a sense for, for learning which reactions are fast and which, which reactions are, are slow um, with real quantification, let's talk about that. Where can you find absolute rate constants? If you're trying to put together some sort of a kinetic picture, maybe you know the equilibrium value, right? Maybe you know the equilibrium constant and so if you could just figure out this one value here, you could predict ahead of time the rate of your reaction. And so where would you find stuff like that? Here's one place. Memorize them. Now that doesn't sound like very practical advice. I haven't memorized very many absolute rate constants, but there's a few that I know. I know the ones that are diffusion controlled. Let me give you an example of, of that kind of a, a scenario. Let's suppose I take a hydronium ion like protonated water in the presence of an acetate anion. I don't have to look up that rate. I know that rate constant. There's a whole series of rate constants that I know the rate for. And this one is easy for me to remember. The rate constant for this proton transfer process where acetate plucks a proton off a hydronium ion is about 10 to the eighth per molar per second and I don't need to go to any table to know about that. 
I just happen to know that. And the reason I know that, and you can look at this and see why this is easy for me to memorize, this is the diffusion controlled rate constant. I just happen to know that highly favorable proton transfers occur at diffusion controlled rates. I just happen to know that. So I don't have to memorize, I can take any highly favorable proton transfer between heteroatoms and I know that those are going to be about 10 to the 8th per molar per second. So that's an easy one to remember. So that's an example of how you might memorize a rate constant. This would be K is equal to that. What's another place that you can go? Type Herb Meyer on Google, the University of, you don't have to type anything else. Just Google it. And up will come his web page for this professor at the University of Munich. And he did the unthinkable. He convinced his graduate students, hey, let's go in and just run reaction kinetics. For your whole PhD, you'll just run reaction kinetics. But what he did is he said, let's do it on the reactions people care about. Instead of the stuff that's been done for the past hundred years, let's focus on carbon-carbon bond forming reactions that are used in modern organic synthesis. Things like allyl silanes, allyl stannanes, enol silyl ethers. And not attacking worthless stuff like iodine, but attacking electrophiles like oxocarbenium ions, protonated aldehydes, iminium ions, the things that make up modern organic synthesis. And so he measured all of these rate constants for the reactions that are most commonly used and will be most commonly used for the next hundred years in organic synthesis. And so he's got this very tricky equation. <clears throat> where he said, look, I, now that I've measured all this stuff, I've got this very simple equation that looks like this. For every single nucleophile, I can rank it in terms of log nucleophilicity and every electrophile log electrophilicity. And he fits it all into one table. He summarizes all of the relative nucleophilicities and all of the electrophilicities of the common nucleophiles and common electrophiles using organic chemistry. Wouldn't you like to know which nucleophiles are a hundred times more reactive than others? Or which electrophiles are a thousand times more reactive or less reactive? Go to his table. Google his name. Total rock star, right? Nobody wants to go in and do kinetics and he, he got his students to do that. And there's a simple rule of thumb that if the sum of these is greater than about minus five, because it's a log value, then the reactions will go at room temperature. <laughs> you can just sit there and stare at his little table and make predictions about organic chemistry. Uh, there's a little fudge parameter here because sometimes there's a matching between nucleophiles and electrophiles. Some electrophiles are positively charged, some are neutral, some nucleophiles are, ne there's things like that that are involved. Okay, so where else can you go if you want to get, want to get absolute rate constants? How many of you have used the Reaccess search database? I would hope that most, it's, you know, it's free, you have free access, as many people can log in as they want. You just draw in the structure for some reaction. And there's a little box where you can type in little stuff, little extra search parameters. And if you type this in, and I can't, I can't remember what this stands for, at rxd.sub equals rate constant. It will search for all reactions in which some, well, the, well, where you draw in the reaction substructure, where somebody has determined rate constants. So at present, there's about 150,000 records in your access database where people have I, uh, determined rate constants. And you can look up those papers and identify them. If you want to go right back to the literature and find a rate constant for a reaction that's similar to yours, those are places where you can go to get, if you ever really care about the details of this stuff, if you ever really find you're not just interested in the concentration dependence, but you want to know something about the specific rate constants, those are places that you can go to find that information. Very powerful stuff. Okay, let's talk about uh, acid-base reactions, things that don't form carbon and carbon bonds. But what you'll find is when you're drawing out mechanisms for things like aminium ion formation, it's like five or six steps of just arrow pushing that is mind numbing and not interesting, but it's present in every one of the reaction mechanisms we're drawing. We have lots of proton transfer steps. And I just want to tell you, don't blow that stuff off. You get powerful intuition um, by looking at them and you can quantify those steps. And I encourage you to do that.
and all you need to know are some PK values. And you can get very powerful intuition about your reactions and what's going on, what's making them fast, and what's making them slow. So here's uh, one edict that I'll issue here that you should always do. Whenever you have a proton transfer step, I expect you to be able to estimate the equilibrium constant for that proton transfer step. Proton transfer steps are always the fast things. That's almost never the rate determining step. Let's take an example of a, of a reaction. There's nothing really important about this reaction. You take an amine, you take a carboxyl carboxylic acid and you condense it to make an amide. That's Nobel Prize winning stuff. If you're Bruce Merrifield. Okay. So you need something to make that <clears throat> uh, kinetically fast. And so one common way to run this reaction is by throwing in a condensing agent, dicyclohexyl carbodiamine. It doesn't matter um, particularly which condensing agent you're using. I want to talk about the mechanism for this because the mechanism doesn't involve the reaction of ethylamine or some amine and some carboxylic acid with DCC. There's an initial step and without this initial step, things don't work very well. So here's the initial thing that's happening in the reaction. The first thing that happens, you always, whenever you do a condensation to make an amide, you always add the condensing agent last. You get screwed if you don't do that. So just in, in practice, but that doesn't matter. Before you get a chance to dump your, your condensing agent DCC in there, when you mix these together, they've already reached equilibrium. In microseconds, there's already an equilibrium and I want to try to draw out these, these species. So let me go ahead and draw out these species. When you do an acid-base reaction here, what you really have in solution is a carboxylate anion. <coughs> <clears throat> and you have an ammonium salt. That's what's really present in your reaction. There's not much of the amine and the, right? If you take an acid and a base, you know that those react. Let's go ahead and draw out the, the carbodiamide species because this is where the reaction gets interesting. I mean, how interesting could that be to take dicyclohexyl carbodiamide and do an amide bond coupling reaction? So when you th throw in some sort of a coupling reagent with an amine and a carboxylic acid, you're not coupling an amine and a carboxylic acid, you're coupling a carboxylate with an ammonium salt. That's really what's coupling together. The reaction depends on you transferring a proton onto this carbodiamide. And this is really the main acid that's present in your solution, not the carboxylic acid. This is your acid that's present in solution. So there's an important equilibrium here that determines how fast this reaction goes. And so I'm going to draw out that, in other words, if you don't protonate this carbodiamide, it's not going to react very fast. And you'll get very little action in your reaction mixture. So the whole reaction depends on you protonating the carbodiamide to make essentially an aminium ion. Right? It's not very easy to attack this, but once you stick a proton in there, super easy. Right? This is starting to look like this scenario over here where you have some sort of uh, rapid equilibration and then there's some reactive intermediate and all of the business that's going on has to do with that reactive intermediate. And so let me draw the other components that are in there, right? Every one of those proton that's transferred leaves a little bit of the free amine in there but not much. But you've got a whole ton of your carboxylate anion floating around. Right? You've got a full equivalent. You, maybe you generated just a tiny bit of these two species, but you've got one full equivalent of your carboxylate anion floating around. And so that's what allows you to start activating the carboxylates to form leaving groups. And everything else after that doesn't matter. Right? This is what sets the stage for the reaction. That's the slow step. And that should not be an uh, it should be, there we go. <clears throat> And I'll just write slow here for this, this addition of the carboxylate anion. So when you, you do a DCC coupling, it's all dependent on you getting a proton on here and this is your proton source. Now, I, I'm talking about pKa's. What good does it help you to know pKa values? This is one of the key pre-equilibrium proton transfer steps. Let's talk about the equilibrium between this. Does anybody know what the pKa for an ammonium, typical amine ammonium salt is or ammonium ion? 
10.5. So I'm going to use a, um, let me use 11 here because I can't handle those fractional numbers. The math becomes too complex. Does anybody know what the pK for an aminium ion is? For an sp2 nitrogen, pyridinium, for example. Pyridinium, imidazolium, they're all about five. It's a good estimate. And that's a super common functional group, so I'd like you to remember that, that pKa for aminium ions in general. Now, just from pKa values, we have super powerful intuition about what's going on here. All right, if I know the pKa values for this, what I really know from these pKa values is I know something about acid strength. Which of these is the stronger acid? The aminium ion or the ammonium ion? The aminium ion is the stronger acid. How much stronger? 10 to the 6th. So we can estimate the equilibrium constant from knowing that. Even I can do this math. Just from knowing the pKs, I can estimate this very rapid equilibrium. And the important thing about knowing this is not really knowing 10 to the minus 6 or the equilibrium constant. The important thing is this. gives me the ability to make a simple statement about what's going on in the reaction, right? Just by knowing pKa's and knowing this equilibrium constant, I can say that only one out of every 10 to the sixth DCC molecules is protonated. So let's write the, out those ratios. There's a million of these, and for every million of those DCC molecules, only one of them is protonated. Only one out of every million DCC molecules is protonated. As soon as you start talking about ratios instead of rate constants in equilibrium, when you talk about ratios, 1 to 10, 10 to 1, 50 to 1, 2 to 1, suddenly you make the molecules human and you can make an interesting chemistry story that other people want to hear about. And you can start to think about it from the perspective of your molecules. Only one out of every million of these is protonated. And all of your reaction depends on that very minor population being attacked by the carboxylate anion. That's how you're going to make interesting chemistry that people want to hear about, is by talking about your molecules in terms of ratios uh, and populations. OK, so use pKa's to estimate equilibrium, because it'll give you this intuitive sense for the relative populations of molecules that are present in your reaction mixture. If there were just some way to make more than one out of 10 to the 6 of those get protonated, you could make the reaction faster. It would be great if we could just know peak, uh, rate constants, elementary rate constants for reactions. And proton transfers are one of the few cases um, where you can guess just by knowing simple information the rate constants for reactions. So I gave you the example of this, diffu this, this rule for diffusion controlled reactions. Let's go ahead and redraw out that, uh, this equilibrium proton transfer. For a carbodiamide, you don't necessarily have to redraw this. I just want to redraw this um, in an uncomplicated way where I can see these rate constants. We can see there's a forward process and a reverse process. 
So I start off with an uh, ethyl ammonium ion, and I end up with this sort of aminium ion, and there's some sort of a proton transfer. <clears throat> so remember, we can estimate this KEQ value here just by knowing the pKa's. Uh, I'm not going to do that right there. But let me remind you of something. So we estimated this to be 10 to the minus 6. But let me remind you that the KEQ is also equal to the ratio of forward rate divided by reverse rate. So this 10 to the 6 from pKa's was an equilibrium number based on concentrations. Um, but we can also correlate that with reaction rates, the equilibrium. And <clears throat> if you know the favorable direction here, the pK of this is about 11, and the pK of this is about 5, and we said this is the stronger acid, our expectation is that the reaction is favored in this direction. If this is the stronger acid, then we ought to write intuitively, it's, you know that from the equilibrium constant. For highly favorable proton transfers between heteroatoms, oxygen and nitrogen, nitrogen and sulfur, oxygen to oxygen, those are the common proton transfers. Where the pKa differences are more than three, the reactions are diffusion controlled. And I don't need to go to any table to look that up. There's a guy named Manfred Eigen that demonstrated that. And so I know that this is about 10 to the eighth per molar per second. Diffusion control in water. So if I substitute in 10 to the minus 8, I can back calculate the forward rate constant. If I know the equilibrium constant from pKa's, and I know this just because it's diffusion controlled, then I can calculate what is K1. Just by doing some simple math. And so let me rearrange these equations. What I would find out if I rearrange those equations is that the reverse rate constant it's 10 to the minus 3 per molar per second. I get all this powerful information just from knowing some pKa values. Right? There's all this powerful information that's available when you want to sit down. So when you write out mechanisms for formation of an imine from a carbonyl compound, six steps, most of those are proton transfers. And you can make strong guesses about all, many, many of the rate constants in that process just from knowing some simple pKa values. OK, so that's powerful stuff. If you ever want to really, yeah. Minus, should it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Thank you for pointing that stuff out. OK, so um, rate equations, rate constants. Let's try to move on. So I'm going to try to uh, move on to the next topic, uh, which is why don't your reactions work? You can analyze this stuff all you want with rate constants and equilibrium constants. But at the end of the day, for most of you, you're in the lab trying to get your reactions to work. And so that, I want to make that the, the next topic, how to analyze that. Why don't reactions work? <clears throat> you know, the reason why reaction, right, reactions don't work in the lab because things are slow. That's not why things don't work for you in the lab. Because anytime you have a reaction slow, you can just heat it up. Just turn up the little heating plate and heat it up. You can make any reaction go faster. That's not why reactions fail. Reactions don't fail because you're running things uphill. Oh, what was I thinking? There I go, running reactions uphill again. Right? That's not why things are failing. Reactions fail because they're not selective. When you heat things up, you start to form byproducts faster than you're forming the stuff that you want, or side products. That's why things fail. And so let's talk about this issue of selectivity. That's what's making your reactions not work. So let's talk about three scenarios for selectivity. You get the stuff you don't want instead of the stuff you want. And this will cover 95% of the cases that you're going to see. 
There's this other irritating 5% that I, I don't know how to deal with. Without, I, I know how to deal with it, but I don't know how to simply explain it to you in one lecture. Okay, so scenario one for selectivity. I, I'm assuming that you're hearing this not for the first time because they should be covering this stuff in every sophomore organic chemistry class. Let's suppose you take a carbonyl compound and you mix it with an amine. Benzaldehyde plus methylamine. That's a feel-good reaction. Here it's T-butyl. <clears throat> this is not what you get. I've drawn the Z isomer, the cis isomer for this imine. I, I think you all know that you get the trans isomer or could have guessed that you get the trans isomer. <coughs> Especially if it's T-butyl. And so why don't you get the cis isomer? You don't get the cis isomer because these equilibrate. And they equilibrium and they equilibrate under the conditions of the reaction. I'm not going to draw the, the mechanism for equilibration, but you can imagine if a nucleophile comes in here, then you can rotate about that double bond, which becomes a single bond. So any nucleophile that adds in here makes it easy to rotate about those bonds. Um, you could also get some slower um, cis to trans for this type of a system. But the, the main point is that under the conditions of the reaction, that's a fast equilibrium. And that's a common scenario uh, for, for why you would get one product over the other. So that's common scenario number one. Common scenario number two, I'm going to switch to a different board just to make sure I have some room here, is kinetic control. And let me specify here for thermodynamic control uh, that the, I'll just spell out the requirement. If you're under thermodynamic control, the products are equilibrating under the conditions of the reaction. For kinetic control, you have competing irreversible reactions. competing irreversible steps. No equilibration between the products, that's irreversible, means they're not equilibrating. So there's two sub-scenarios here for kinetic control and I expect you to be able to, to distinguish these two scenarios. Here's one common scenario where there is a single intermediate, a reactive intermediate in your reaction that has a choice to do two things. Usually the thing that you want and the thing that you don't want. And if you can identify that one intermediate and that one step, then you have a chance of solving the problems in your reaction. I'm going to take this as an example here. <clears throat> Let's suppose you have this alcohol and you want to methylate that or alkylate that or do something to that alcohol so it's not an OH. The problem that is as soon as you add in some sort of a base here to this reaction, and generate this alkoxide anion. Now that has choices. Right? It'd be great if there was only one choice, which is to give you the stuff that you want. Maybe you're going to have methyl iodide present in the reaction mixture. What you really want is to O-alkylate that, that alcohol or maybe add some protecting group, a PMB protecting group so you can drag this through many steps. Alkylating agent doesn't really matter. The problem is that the second you make this very nucleophilic, there's the choice for it to do this, a retroaldol to release the ring strain in that four-membered ring. And that, it turns out, is very fast. And once you open that up, I'm going to draw a seven-membered ring here, so this is how I usually draw seven-membered rings. <clears throat> once you open that up to a seven-membered ring, it doesn't reclose back to give you that strained product again. It's over. It's opened. And this can protonate on workup or under the conditions of the reaction. Right? Something pulled this proton off. It can re-deliver the proton back to there. I'm not going to show the fate of that enolate. It can just get protonated. And this is a typical scenario that you face in the lab. You generate some reactive intermediate and you want it to do one thing but it does something else faster. And if this is ten times faster, you'll get ten times more of this. 
And if this is 10 times faster, you'll get 10 times more of what you want. You can control that. How do you make this 10 times faster? You had 10 times more methyl iodide, right? You can change that ratio. You have the power to change that ratio. So that's one scenario when you have one um, reactive intermediate that has a choice. OK, let's take scenario number two under kinetic control. And so all of these things together account for about 95% of organic reactions. <clears throat> so one scenario is you have a single intermediate and that intermediate has a choice to do two things. But the other possible scenario is you have equilibrating intermediates. And I'll draw out that scenario here. Let's imagine we have this enolate. I'll put a methyl group on one side. And if we have some sort of a proton source in there, maybe we didn't add a strong enough base and do this irreversibly, we can protonate the enolate and then deprotonate on the other side. Very fast. If you have just a tiny bit of alcohol or unreacted ketone, unreacted ketone that, you know, if you make this from a ketone, you could re transfer a proton here and then pluck it back off of there. And that will be very fast in aldol reactions. It doesn't matter that it's two steps. It just matters that you've got two highly reactive species that are in equilibrium with each other under the conditions of the reaction. And so if you want to o this, each one of these can silylate. I'm not going to draw TMS chloride as the reagent. You can get that. So I've got two different enolates in equilibrium in my reaction. <clears throat> and now both of these can do something irreversible. Once you put the silicon on there, it's over. So this would be an example of kinetic control because the silylation step is irreversible. But instead of all arising from a single intermediate here and two elementary steps from here, we've got two equilibrating intermediates. And each one has a choice. And you'll want to know something. If you really want to understand this reaction, you need to know something about the relative amounts of these and the rates at which each of these silylate. if you want to truly understand why you get the, the ratios of products that you do. OK, so those are the three common scenarios. There's, there's thermodynamic control. And then there's these two scenarios that are related to kinetic control. And so hopefully you can look at a reaction, draw out some plausible mechanism, and then try to decide which of those three scenarios uh, do, do things fit into. OK, so let's talk about the energetic consequences of this. There's another dimension here um, that we should talk about. And it's an energy dimension. This is what makes organic chemistry so hard. Right, you have to think about the structures of molecules in three dimensions. And then there's another dimension, energy, that I'm not depicting. Nothing I've drawn here tells you about the energy of that. And so in addition to this three-dimensional structure picture of organic chemistry, there are extra dimensions like energy the energetics, and not just the energy of the overall mo all molecule, but there's other dimensions of energy like the energies of the, of the molecular orbitals that, are, that make up that molecule. OK, so let's talk about a way to depict energy. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate this. So we're going to use reaction coordinate energy diagrams. So when you draw out some sort of a reaction like this, if you can draw some conclusions about which of these two enolates is more stable, the substituted one is. Right? More substituted alkenes tend to be more stable if all else is equal. And you know something about the relative rates for O silylation. Gee, is that methyl really going to affect silylation more when it's here versus when the double? Maybe not. If you can draw some conclusions about the energies of, of intermediates and in the transition states, you can sketch out a reaction coordinate energy diagram. OK, so let me draw, um, I'm going to draw four of these. But I just want to start off with a very simple reaction coordinate energy diagram. And what you should be plotting is free energy. In fact, if you write just E here, it's fine. I just want to distinguish these from molecular orbital energy diagrams. And there's always this mysterious thing called a reaction coordinate down here. What does that mean? 
it's kind of mystifying what the reaction coordinate means. If you're doing a proton transfer, it's very obvious. You can, you can give that variable a very specific uh, parameter here. Like you could, you could assign that to be the distance between proton and that alkoxide, right? If you wanted to give this an actual measurable number. But most reactions aren't that simple. You're not going to be plotting reaction coordinate diagrams for a simple proton transfer like that. You're going to be interested in, in reactions that have um, lots of reagents and lots of bonds. So I'm going to draw a, a typical, this would be an example of a reaction coordinate diagram. And what do we care about with this reaction coordinate diagram? Here's the things that we care about. Let's, let's talk about the things that we care about here. What we care about <clears throat> is the relative energies, for example, between the starting material and the reactants or sorry, starting material in the products. And we'll assign that a, it's a difference in free energies. It's not a free energy. We're interested in the difference. We, almost, we never care about the absolute energies of anything in organic chemistry. We only care about differences in free energy. And so it's that difference in free energy that, de that determines whether this reaction is going to be even possible at all. And we always run reactions downhill. We don't run reactions uphill. That's not. There's nothing you can do to make a reaction, an uphill reaction uh, work except changing the reaction. That's about the only thing. The other thing we care about is the distance here to this transition state. And we call that the transition state free energy or the free energy of activation would be a better word. Transition state free energy would be an absolute energy. But we care about the difference between that transition state free energy and the ground state energy of our starting materials. <clears throat> the important thing is, see all these little steps here that I didn't really draw horizontal energy bars for? We don't care about those. We don't care about those. Even if you can draw, right, there's, I'm drawing something with one, two, three, four, four little hills before you get to this rate determining step right here. That's the rate determining step. We don't care about these small little hills in our scenarios. So none of the reaction coordinate diagrams I'm going to show you. I'm going to stop drawing. I'm going to stop drawing these little steps. I'm just going to focus on the hills, and I'm going to focus on the valleys that are important. I'm going to focus on the rate determining step, and there will be something later that may be the same or not called the selectivity determining step, and those are the only things that we'll focus on. All of this stuff that's in rapid equilibrium is just distracting us from this. So I'm going to smooth out these curves. So this is super important here, that all these small steps, shockingly, don't matter for kinetics. Now, if you're interested in learning what makes species reactive and the interaction of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals, then we really do focus on those little steps. But for kinetics, just forget that stuff. Draw smooth curves. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so let's take our, our scenarios for selectivity and let's sketch them out. <clears throat> so the scenario, one scenario for thermodynamic control, so I'm not going to write the word reaction coordinate on the bottom you know, plotting reaction coordinate versus energy. I'm just going to leave that off. You can just assume it says reaction coordinate, which, um, so here, so he, see how I've smoothed this out to, so that we don't care how many steps are involved? So here's one scenario, like that imine, this is kind of similar to that imine scenario, where you form one product, and according to the diagram that I've drawn out here, the only thing that matters here under the conditions of this reaction is the relative stabilities, the free energy difference between the starting material and the products. If I've got two different products, A and B, cis and trans, sin and anti, endo and exo, according to my diagram, the slow step is up here, and there's more than enough energy for these two things to interconvert. My diagram tells me that there's more than enough energy. Right? If I had energy to make it over this, I've got more than enough energy to rapidly equilibrate back and forth between these species. And so the only thing that matters here is the free energy difference between A and B. That's what determines the selectivity. That's what determines whether I get a 95-5 ratio, a 2 to 1 ratio. That's all that matters. So this is thermodynamic control. 
Doesn't matter whether it's a 15 step mechanism for these two things to interconvert or a one step mechanism. Doesn't matter. It's totally irrelevant. The only thing that matters is, uh, is the difference in those energies. Okay, let's take another example of a common scenario for a reaction coordinate diagram. Kinetic control. I'll draw two uh, diagrams here on this board, if I can fit them here. So here would be one scenario for kinetic control, where I have some high energy intermediate, like that alkoxide with the strain four-membered ring. And it has two choices. And, and I'm not going to write starting material here, I'll just write uh, intermediate. It could be the starting material, but it's totally irrelevant whether this is my original starting material or some reactive intermediate. The point is, I've got something in there that has two choices. And that one species that has two choices has a difficult choice that's high in energy and a not so difficult choice that's low in energy. And the selectivity that I get at the end of this is going to be solely determined by the energy difference here. The energy difference in these transition states. So the transition state, and let me try to use a different pen color here. So <clears throat> in order to go from A to B here, let me make, or to A or B, if my reactive intermediate has a choice to form, form A, there's some transition state energy here. And I don't really care much about that. That's the free energy of activation to go to B. It costs this much energy, free energy. If I want to go to product, I've got that backwards, I apologize, that's A. If I want to go to product B, I've got a different free energy of activation. And the only thing, I don't even care about what those numbers are, all I care about is the difference. That difference in free energies determines whether I get a 10 to 1 ratio, a 2 to 1 ratio, or a 1 to 1 ratio. How do you know whether you're getting a 1 to 1 ratio? Look at your NMR. Look at your TLC. Look at the LCMS for your reaction. You, you can easily estimate what these ratios are. And if you know those ratios, you can back calculate this free energy of act, this difference in free energies. And sorry, that should be a, not just delta G. It should be a difference between these two delta Gs. And we refer to that as a delta delta G double dagger. So you might hear me refer to delta delta G double dagger. That's the symbol for this difference in these differences. Okay, so that's one of the kinetic scenarios. Let's take a look at the second kinetic scenario that we mentioned. So on, our, on the problem set that we're going to hand out today, I'm going to ask you to be drawing these scenarios. Right? These are the common ones. So here's the other scenario where you have two reactive in, uh, intermediates equilibrating rapidly, back and forth, back and forth, small barrier, rapidly. Maybe this is the starting material you started off with in your reaction. And maybe you have to protonate it to make some reactive species back and forth, back and forth very rapidly. And then slowly, each of these has a choice to do one of two things. This would be an example of a case where you've got two rapidly interconverting intermediates and each one independently has a choice to form some product. And this is really if you think about it, just a special case of this. Remember how I told you I wasn't going to worry about those little bumps in these big hills? Well, really, this is kind of like a little bump on the way over that big hill. I'm kind of just showing you the same scenario over again. Um, so I'm kind of cheating. I'm making it look like there's more stuff going on than is going on. So let's. Let's draw this out because what I just told you before is still true. The only thing that differs in determining the, the ratio of A to B that you get is this difference in free energies of activation between the transition state for B and the transition state for A. That tiny little energy difference. Doesn't matter the relative ratios of these. That stuff doesn't matter. The overall activation energy barriers, you, the absolute rate barriers here and here, you don't really care. You just care about that little difference and that's what determines whether you see big spots and little spots on your TLC plate, 10 to 1 ratios in your NMR or 2 to 1 ratios in your NMR, it's that little activation energy barrier difference um, that you care about.
Okay, so I'm gonna, going to assign you problems. I'll ask you to construct reaction coordinate diagrams um, and sketch them out because I want to really, I want to encourage you to focus in on identifying what is the difference? What energy difference here is determining your selectivity in your reaction? Because it's the selectivity that's killing you in organic chemistry. Okay, what's the problem with reaction coordinate energy diagrams? And the problem is pretty simple. <clears throat> This is the problem. Let me just remind you of something called the reaction isotherm equation. Looks like this. Where you take products over reactants. And you can rearrange this. I, I'm positive you, you all know how to rearrange this mathematically. This is the same equation just rearranged in terms of this concentration difference. So uh, you all know the reaction isotherm equation, I hope. Uh, here's the problem with that. Suppose I assign you to teach some class or some lab and I said, well, you're going to be grading some papers in that class and this is how many papers you're going to be grading. Are you getting screwed or is that a good, what's going on with that? Is that a good deal? Or let's suppose you go buy a cup of coffee after class because you're tired and the lecture was boring and it costs you this. Right? Is that a good deal or not? Well, you don't think in terms of logarithms or, nobody thinks like that. There's nothing, and I, we're going to draw all these diagrams where you're using free energies and kcals per mole and none of that stuff is going to be intuitive for you. You don't sit around in the lab thinking like this, natural log or exponent. And so how do you make things useful? How do you make those numbers in these reaction coordinate diagrams actually useful and intuitive for you when you're sitting around in the lab running a column, collecting fractions, <clears throat> and let me just remind you of how to make those things useful. Kind of relates back to those uh, how to use K, uh, pKa values. And the way to make it useful is to convert free energies back into numerical ratios. Every time I give you a free energy value, or you derive a free energy value, you use an electronic structure calculation package and you estimate energy differences in kcals per mole, you ought to be converting those into numerical ratios. And let me just remind you of, uh, I hope you already know this, this is very important, this is at room temperature, that every 1.4 kcals per mole correlates with a factor of 10. And that's a numerical ratio. And it's a factor of 10 in either equilibrium constant or in rate constants. Depending on whether you're, if you're comparing transition states, 1.4 kcals per mole is a factor of 10 in rates, rate constants. If you're comparing ground states where two things are equilibrating, 1.4 kcals per mole is a factor of 10 in the ratios of those two equilibrating intermediates. So there's a, a more sophisticated number. If you've mastered, if you ever master this thing, I hope you'll master this because it's powerful and easy to use. If you ever master that, here's another number for you to remember. 0.4 kcals per mole is a factor of two. I'll show you how to use these things. Let me give you an example. And what I want to do is talk about the additivity of free energies versus the multiplicity, the multiplication, the factor um, math that's related to um, rate constants and equilibrium constants. You add these, you multiply these. And I'll just say 
you add free energies and you multiply rate constants and equilibrium constants. That's how you deal with them. Let's take an example where you have some sort of a reactive species here and you want to form a carbon nitrogen bond. But this lone pair is on the bottom of the molecule. In order for this nitrogen to attack, you have to wait for this to do a chair flip that puts this thing axial. And of course, axial groups cost energy. And you may not know exactly this energy, but you may know the energy cost to put an ethyl group axial on a cyclohexane. This is a little lower. I'm not going to draw the, the rest of this. The important part is you can get, make some sort of a guesstimate. Maybe you could get on a computer and do a, an electronic structure calculation. Something to allow you to estimate that the energy difference here is 1.8 kcals per mole. Right? That's easy to draw that picture on a computer and say, give me the energies of each of those. It's easy to get numbers like this. What does that mean? What it means, or you're sitting in a seminar and somebody tells you that. 1.8 kcals per mole is like a factor, is like 1.4 kcals per mole plus 0.4 kcals per mole. It's kind of like, this number here is kind of like a factor of 10 and a factor of 2. And you multiply factors. So as soon as you hear the number 1.8 kcals per mole or 2 kcals per mole, which is pretty similar, you ought to be thinking, wow, what's that, what that's telling me is that this thing is sitting in equilibrium and the ratio of the starting conformation versus this less stable axial conformation is about 20 to 1. Only one out of 20 molecules at any point in time exists in this conformation ready to attack. And so you're fighting that in this reaction. So whenever you see free energy numbers, I'd like you to convert it mentally into ratio numbers because ratio numbers will be intuitive to you. Okay, so when we come back on Monday, there's an exam on Friday on pericyclic reactions. When we come back on Monday, we're going to talk more about free energy diagrams. And I hope you'll be taking those free energies and converting them back into numerical ratios. And we'll talk more about that. And I'll see you guys at discussion.